Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for coming today. And I'm really excited that we're here to talk about the sort of uh, science that we can get from high energy density uh, physics. But I'm going to take a step back a little bit and talk about fusion, um, which is always 20 years away, isn't it, by definition, which is the old joke. I know there's a bit of a groan in the back there. But actually, I, I think that's probably not true any longer. I think it does feel now a lot closer. And that is both driven by the science and the uh, commercial work in this sort of area. And that's what we're here to kind of recognize today, how we can get that perfect intersection between uh, science and, uh, and commercial uh, undertaking. So I'm going to give, uh, if you're a fusion uh, expert, you're going to find this slightly dull. Um, um, so it's a bit kind of high level and governmenty, uh, uh, which is what I'm given to, to do. So, um, you know, in a sense, I think this is where we start on this. What world, in, what world changing ideas, small or big, would you like to see implemented by humanity? And Stephen Hawking answered, this is easy. I would like to see the development of fusion power to give unlimited supply of clean energy. And I think they are, they, it really is as simple as that. It is a potential world changing uh, technology. Uh, and I think also, I was reading on the train on the way down here, you know, it is one of the areas where the UK genuinely is a science superpower. You know, I, I don't think we should be ashamed uh, you know, about that. We have invested at scale, and we are here and have a room full of people because of that kind of high energy science uh, that we lead uh, in the UK. Just to kind of give you kind of uh, the net zero perspective on that, because I come from the Department of Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, it's probably, it's probably unlikely to make a large scale, significant net zero contribution pre-2050. Uh, but actually that private sector innovation um, alongside the public sector investment can shorten the timescales, I think, for that, that scale-up capability uh, and that long-term view. And I think it's back to that we have in the UK invested in this in the long term. I'm, I'm reading a lot of books about innovation policy at the moment. and They say the one thing about innovation policy is stick at what you're doing uh, for a long period of time. And this is one area where we have done that. And I think that because of that, we have that opportunity in the UK to lead uh, the transition from fusion research into uh, fusion commerce and at the same time create a considerable export opportunity I think uh, for the UK as well. And What does that ecosystem look like that's required to deliver that? It, it's a classical ecosystem I think uh, if you will. It's the government supporting national laboratories, private industry and academia. So it's not even a triple helix uh, because there's four things. Uh, so I don't know what four things are that, that are that are. Is it a jigsaw puzzle? I have no idea. Uh, uh, that are that are uh, bonded together. But actually, if we look at each one of those and we think about each one of those, actually we look at strengths in the UK uh, that we have uh, in that and and consistency uh, around that. Taking actually our fundamental science and translating it through into that. We're taking a systems approach to that we're, we're actually thinking a little bit about, you know. How does science support that industry and how does industry support that science? And I think that's very much that kind of system thinking that we're actually very good at in the UK, I think, uh, around that and, and in, a, in a way to produce that, that requirement for, for fusion energy but also recognise that's absolutely built on strong fundamental science that underpins it. We have to have that systems approach uh, to delivering that. But just take the government perspective and, and, and step back a little bit of that. In October 2021, uh, we produced the UK Fusion Energy Strategy. Uh, it had two uh, major goals, the first of which was for the UK to demonstrate the commercial viability of fusion by building a prototype reactor plant in the UK that puts energy on the grid. And we've now uh, moved that forward. The site for that has been announced uh, and, and we're moving forward on that. But also, really, uh, the second part of that was also to build a world-leading fusion industry that can export technology around the world in subsequent uh, um, uh, decades. Uh, so recognizing that ecosystem approach that I taught uh, about that. And really, when we look at the UK fusion energy strategy, there are a number of, of things we take into account, the momentum direction of both industry and academia and our national laboratories uh, in that. Um, our international leadership and collaboration, uh, though that's uh, taking a little bit of a hit at the moment, I think, uh, around some of the Euratom, and we should recognise that uh, as part of uh, the ongoing uh, difficulties uh, with Horizon uh, and the like. 
But we do still have international leadership and we do still internationally collaborate as part of that. We have technical leadership uh, and working and we need to enhance that as well as the commercial bit as that. And the strategy looks at the way that we, could, we can drive that forward and recognises regulation, which I'll come back to in a few moments, as an underpinning and central part uh, of that as well. So what's the role of really UK uh, government in this? Um, correct market failures. I, I, I hate that phrase, actually. I really do hate that phrase with a passion. Uh, um, why can't that be market creation? Yeah, why does it have to be about failure of the market? I, I'm sorry, I'm, read, I'm reading another innovation book at the moment that says you should never use the phrase uh, market failure. It's wrong. So actually, I, I, I will correct the government strategy and say that it's market creation. Uh, it's about that capability building to create new markets. It's not about a failure of the market as well. The government's very keen, and why we're here today, about providing that convening power to building those networks, enable collaboration nationally and internationally. We're very grateful to the Royal Society today for hosting this meeting to look at the science underpinning aspects of this, and really uh, um, maintain our, our investments in fusion technology and facilities, and also uh, look to grow and retain uh, the talent, including the supporting engine disciplines, uh, supporting engineering disciplines. And that is, you cannot forget people in this. People are an incredibly important part of being able to deliver that. And I think it's easy to say we need more skills. I, I don't know anybody who doesn't violently uh, agree with that statement. Uh, but actually delivering that, I think, is, is, is challenging. And this is an area, I think, of, of science and engineering that can really excite people uh, to want to be uh, part of it. But we need to get the next generation uh, in here uh, around, around this. Within the strategy as well, we look at the, the role of commercial uh, leadership, uh, the want to... Uh, have a vibrant self-sustaining fusion technology cluster in the UK and tracked inward investment, equip UK firms to compete in the global market, as well as recognising that you need a supply chain and skills base, as I've talked about, in order to do that with both public and private sector investment and also large-scale deployment in order to do that. So really there are the features that we, we see sitting alongside that of science, government, national laboratories working alongside each other with a common purpose, uh, really a common outcome in order to do this. And that really is this kind of working together to deliver sustainable fusion power and maximise both the scientific and economic benefits where private industry is good at the things that are listed on the left there and government can use its, its ability of convening force, international uh, regulation, and also skills in order to do this. So that's an important, uh, oh, well, I was about to say synergy. Can I say synergy on a Monday morning? I'm not sure. Uh, working together, uh, better working together uh, around, uh, around these sort of things. The synergy does sound better on that occasion, doesn't it? Uh, regulation is an important part of this. You know, I, and I think that the regulation... Uh, uh, for fusion energy needs clearly to be safe, transparent and innovative. And I think that we recognised the Regulatory Horizons Council uh, about a year ago said quite clearly do not regulate uh, fusion as you regulate fission. Uh, do not recognise, do <laughs> recognise they are totally uh, different things. Uh, they they both, both have the word nuclear after them but that's about where it ends really. And I think that uh, we recognise that, that you know, we're going to look to make that safe uh, transparent and also think a little bit about innovation I do recommend to you to have a look at the Regulatory Horizons Council's report uh, on this which did think a little bit about the way that we can use regulation to be innovative and actually we're going to be working over uh, over uh, the next year or so to work out a new regulatory framework um, Government decisions in the consultation that we made uh, on this will be regulated on the legal framework and already placed for that uh, the regulated approach will apply to all planned fusion prototype energy and the government is legislated to make it clear in law the regulatory treatment of fusion energy and that's all that question of, of, of making sure that we have the most progressive regulation around that. So fusion energy facilities be regulated by the Health and Safety Executive and the Environment Agency and uh, we probably will end up with an equivalent uh, devolved regulator but not the ONR. Uh, I have nothing against the ONR, they're wonderful people, but it's, it's, it, this, is, uh, this, is, this is not, uh, this is not uh, for them on this occasion. Um, so, uh, th so I think actually you know, thinking a little bit about how progressive to make that regulation uh, will be important. So we do have a future, uh, and a future strong, uh, and 
it's one of Nick's um, uh, toys, uh, so to speak, uh, as part of this, and recognising that we are on this, uh, on this kind of different and diverse pathways to achieving, uh, achieving uh, it, and that we should be in the UK building both the science and the technology that allows that. The Fusion Industrial Association has made the point that if you look at this, you know, the growth in the sector in the UK and the total number of private fusion companies by year is, is growing uh, virtually exponentially over this period of time. And many of them are embedded in the UK ecosystem uh, in terms of the way that they work. And I think one of the things that we, um, in, I hate saying we in government, I'm not sure I can say we in government, I'm an independent scientist, but the way that government is working is to make sure that we've got that partnership and collaboration to make sure that we can grow that, that fusion cluster. And actually the evidence so far is that you know, um, investment follows investment and actually there is a kind of a virtuous circle uh, becoming around a cluster of skills, technology and knowledge. And I hope you're not all poaching uh, people off each other because that would be not a, a good way forward. Uh, but um, um, uh, around this. But you can see the, the substantial growth in this. So I've talked a little bit about the, the fusion strategy and the framing for that. But I think the most exciting thing about this is not kind of regulation or government strategies. It's actually what the, the science uh, behind this and some of the science that really uh, comes, uh, that underpins this. And there are some key challenges that all obviously lead to sustained power. And they are you know, the challenges of plasma control, fuel handling, uh, reactor maintenance, systems integration. I mean, there's some really, really interesting science in the material science that does that. Alongside innovative engineering that we're going to have to have to, to deliver that. So we are, I think, in, in a great place. And if I look around those kind of six key things, I can think of all things that are already underway to actually achieve and move that forward as part of that. But when I look at that list, it's also... Uh, absolutely underpinned by having access to the scientific data alongside the engineering ambition to be able to deliver the different elements of the, of the key challenges that we require uh, of science alongside uh, fusion, uh, science to deliver uh, commercial fusion as part of that. So uh, um, if you type in, actually, if you type in fusion to, to Google and New Scientist, you'll see that they write an article about every nine months, I think, on fusion. So, I mean, their latest uh, is this. Uh, you know, are we separating height from reality in the push for unlimited power, the new age of fusion? Um, and actually, I think that that's what we're here to do today. Absolutely, is separate the hype. Uh, from the, uh, to separate hype from reality, to talk about where we are, what we need in terms of, of science to really uh, push the UK to the next level uh, with our international partners to deliver a, a new age uh, for fusion. So thank you very much and I hope you have a really good day and I think that looking at this important question of how these sort of facilities can be used to, to provide uh, new insights into science is absolutely a, a really important, absolutely important, it's a really important thing uh, to be doing. I'm very grateful to the Royal Society for hosting uh, this which is an important uh, part of realising our overall vision uh, for this. Thank you very much indeed.